Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. You can be seated. Good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here? Yeah, let me tell you, I, I am really excited today. In fact, uh, you are at the 9 o'clock, uh, and, and at the 11 o'clock, we're going to do three baptisms, and I want to encourage you. Uh, amen? It's good. Uh, three adults, and I kind of wanted to share this with you because I want you to watch it. Uh, maybe if you go home and you can watch it on Facebook Live or, or you can uh, catch it during the week, but uh, just tell you a little bit of story. A few weeks ago, a young man was sitting over here, and uh, I want you to hear these stories because this is really what we're about, uh, and gave uh, the gospel, and, 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 and I asked if anybody wanted to be saved, and literally, I thought the guy was going to jump out of the chair, Nancy. He was sitting about where you are right there, and, and I asked him to raise his hands, and literally both hands went up in surrender. And uh, just, I, I love, I've been working with him over the last three weeks. It's just such a cool story. Doing a wedding at the end of September. I was meeting with a couple this last week and uh, was sharing with them and asking them about their story. And she was saved as a young girl and, and uh, grew up and, and did not make the best decisions. And he's been to prison three times and got saved in prison his last time then. And, and, and he's got over 400 days sobriety now uh, since he's been out. And it's, it's just a cool story. Uh, so anyway, uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, uh, that, that's, that, that's kind of who we are. That, we're all about relationships. We're all about seeing people saved. And in fact, if you're visiting with us today, I'm going to be sharing today the heartbeat of our church. And, and you couldn't be here on a better day if you're watching by Facebook, you're watching on Etex, and uh, if you're there, thank you for watching. But I, I'm telling you, you couldn't be here on a better day because we all have perceptions of church. Uh, we all have perceptions of the Bible. And, and I know some people come to me and they go, do you really believe all that Old Testament stuff? And do you really believe all that New Testament stuff? And it's always interesting to get in those conversations with people and talk to them about Jesus and talk to them about the church. But you know, here, here's what I know. Simply, simply put, Summit Heights exists for one reason. And we exist to connect people to God and others. And the bottom line in everything that we do is relationships. Because listen, if people are going to have a relationship with God, then they've got to understand it only comes through Jesus Christ. Right. It's only through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except by me. But the, also, we want people to be in relationship with each other. Jesus even said this one time. He said, look, man, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But also love your neighbors yourself. He said, all the prophets, all the laws, everything is summed up in that. In fact, Jesus said that the great commandment is simply that, is love the Lord your God. In Matthew chapter 22, look at it, you can see it uh, there. He just says, love the God with all your heart, your soul and mind. And this is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like, love your neighbor yourself. And the law and the prophets hang on these. Everything we do is about two relationships. We want everyone in Hawkins, America to know Jesus. I'm just gonna stop for a minute, okay? You go, I don't live in Hawkins, America. So if you live in Mineola, we want everybody in Mineola to know Jesus. We're just foolish enough to think we can reach everybody in Big Sandy. And we're crazy enough to believe that God may give us all of Hawkins. <laughs> Some of you are looking at me like I'm crazy. But see, after we reach those people in Hawkins and Big Sandy and Mineola and all these surrounding areas, then we want people doing life together. We gave over 7,000 pounds of food away this last Friday. Isn't that crazy? Over 7,000 pounds. I mean, John, that's a, that's a lot of food. And this year, over 20 tons, I think 30 tons now, I don't know, I don't know, 50 tons, it's getting up there, I know that. 
when you start looking at the amount of food that goes out of this place, because we really believe it's about relationship and we want people in relationship. In fact, here's what it looked like in the New Testament. Look at Acts 2, 42. It's one of my favorite passages. It says, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. That there was a group of people that came to know Jesus and they started following Jesus, the resurrected Christ. See, they, they didn't follow Jesus because he was a great teacher. They followed Jesus because the resurrection changed everything. The resurrection changed everything. And then they all were gathered in this town. And so they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to know more. Tell us more about this Jesus. Tell us more about this church thing and the fellowship. They were hanging out. They were hanging out and doing life as Joe was talking about a while ago. They were actually just seeing each other at, at Red Rooster. They didn't have Red Rooster then, okay? Some of you guys are like, that's in there? We're, we're, Red. They were hanging out at the gym. They were hanging out together, they were fellowshipping together, but they were breaking bread and they were praying. You see, it looked that way in the beginning. And and in the early church, here's what they said. Church was something they were. Church is something they are, not something they go to. And somewhere in the journey, somewhere along the way, church became a place we go. No longer something we are. The consequence is, I think Christianity has become a set of beliefs that can be debated, that can be shot down instead of a way of life. And I think God called us something bigger than that. He called us to be the church, not go to church. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says this. It's a great commission. It says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Everybody say Go. Really what that means is as you're going, it doesn't mean that you're gonna have to leave this place and go somewhere, it means as you're going. That means as you're doing life, you're going to work, you're at the gym, you're at the Red Rooster, you're at Petty's, you're at these different places you hang out in. He says, as you go, make disciples of all nations. See, Jesus made the assumption that you're gonna go ahead and witness and you're gonna win people to Jesus. So if you're winning people to Jesus and you're winning them to the way of life, then he says this, I want you to make disciples and I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then I want you to teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. And listen to me, if you're scared to do this, here's what I'm telling you, I'm surely, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. And some of you go, man, I can never disciple. Here's what Jesus says. Number one, I have the authority. Number two, I'm never never going to leave you and I'm always going to be there for you. In other words, I'm going to help you along the journey. See, at Summit Heights, we believe spiritual growth is circular rather than linear. Some of us have this idea that spiritual growth, we do this step, we do this step. See, I grew up in the seven steps of following Jesus. Y'all remember those? After you prayed to receive Jesus, there were seven steps or there was four happy hops or whatever. And it, it seems like we always go, okay, finish this one, then finish this one, then finish. And I grew up under navigators, if you're familiar with that. We're navigators, you did this book, then you did this book, then you did this. And it was all linear. And here's what I've learned over the last 50 years of life. Here's what I've learned is life is not linear, is it? Life is a mess. Anybody else feel that way? I mean, it seems like I'll be linear for a little while and and the whole thing just falls apart. (laughs) I think God uses catalysts for our growth, practical teaching. That's why you're here this morning. That's why you listen to your podcast and that's why you listen to those different things. But I think God also uses relationships. Those providential relationships that, that, that you're developing every day and you're developing hopefully weekly in your groups and disciplines and circumstances and ministries. And those catalysts don't happen on a linear model. They happen in this big mess called life that we're walking with him. And to grow in your relationship with God, here's what we firmly believe. Joe was just talking about, Danielle looked over at me a while ago and said, Joe's preaching your sermon. I said, let him. Maybe they'll hear You see, we really believe at Summit Heights, if you're gonna grow spiritually, you can grow on your own. I've had some friends of mine that just gave up on church years ago. I just have church at home. And I used to go, you can't do that because I wasn't old enough to really understand yet. But here's what I do know. If you wanna take your growth exponential to the next level, it's gonna happen in relationships. It's gonna happen in small groups. You see, small groups and significant relationships are vital, I believe, for the growing Christian, for the one who calls himself a believer in Jesus. They'll radically change you, and they'll radically change this church, and they have. And that's why we believe so strongly in groups, because, see, here's what small groups do. They undercut two myths that critically cripple the church today. Two myths that cripple the church, the holy man and the holy place. 
Years ago, I preached this message and I learned it from a guy named Larry Osborne out in California. And Larry's helped us through the years at our church and been emailing back and forth through the years. And, and I remember when I first came across this, the holy man myth and the holy place myth. In fact, when I taught this about eight years ago, Jim McMahon, who attends our church, he still calls me the holy man today every time he sees me because he remembers that message. Because see, here's what the holy man myth says. Look at it on the screen. It says, it's the idea that pastors or church staff or clergy somehow have a more direct line to God. And it cripples a church because it overburdens pastors and underutilizes the gifts and anointing of everyone else. And it mistakenly equates leadership gifts with superior spirituality. See, many of you grew up like I did. And, and, and here's, a, here's a culture I grew up in. Hire the holy man and he'll do all the holy work, Amen. And it was the most unrealistic job description you could ever give a man to be both a theologian and a CEO to be both a theologian and a small group leader and a custodian and the hospital and the doctor and all these things that they put on them. It's his job, it's her job, it ain't my job, it's not my calling, that's why we pay him. I remember people used to tell me that. Hey, we pay you to do that, boy. Mm. It's one man's job to make all the hospital visits. It's one man's job to notice if you guys aren't here out of 600 people every week every week, making sure y'all are not on the second row. I know they're in y'all's seat, okay? Y'all normally sit on that side. <laughs> Just pointing out the obvious here for those that don't know, okay? So y'all need to scoot down and let them sit where they normally sit, okay? <laughs> it's one man's job to make all the celebrations, all the births, all the things that happen, amen? to baptize everyone exclusively. I remember when I first became pastor here and we had 40 people. I didn't baptize anybody for a year. And people would come up to me, aren't you the pastor? I'm like, yeah, but see, you catch them, you clean them. You catch them, you clean them. And so if you win somebody to Jesus, if you're the dad of your home, then guess what? You're the priest of your home. So if your wife gets saved, you baptize her. And listen, mom, if you win your son to Jesus at home at night, that's not my responsibility, that's yours, baptize them. <laughs> It's an impossible job description. And you know, in the Old Testament, there's this passage because this goes way back. In fact, if, if you go back to Exodus chapter 18, we find where Moses almost set himself up for this. And it wasn't unusual in that day, but uh, he, he would have two to three million people when he brought Israel out of bondage and they, they were in the promised land and they would bring all these people together, two to three million people a day. And Moses was the one guy that set himself up as the judge, the one guy that set himself up to, to take care of those people. And it was during this time that Moses' father-in-law came to visit him. And, 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 and let's pick it up in, in Exodus chapter 18, verse nine. It says, Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things the Lord had done for Israel and rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro gets there and he's looking at all this and he's seeing everything happening. He's so proud of his son-in-law. And then in verse 13, the next day, Moses took his seat to serve as judge for the people. And they stood around him from morning till evening. Get the picture of this, Okay. <laughs> they stood around him from morning till evening. And when his father-in-law saw that all that Moses was doing to the people, he said, what is this you are doing for the people? Why do you alone set as judge while all these people stand around you from morning till evening? Can you imagine that? Two to three million people every day wanting something from you. Now, before we're too hard on Moses, you gotta understand in that day, that's what they did. That's what they did during those days from scripture and history of nations and rulers of nations. They acted as judge and it was carried over even into the tradition of Israel and that they set up these judges and these people came and they would, they would hear the verdict of the judges and they only went to one holy man in one holy place and he had the final judgment. And this all continued through. And then in verse 15, Moses answered him. He said, because the people come to me to seek God's will. I mean, that sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Whenever they have a dispute, it's brought to me and I decide between the parties and inform them of God's decrees and instructions. Verse 17, Moses' father-in-law replied, what you are doing is not good. You and these people who come to you will only wear yourselves out. The work is too heavy for you. You can't handle it alone. 
Listen now to me and I will give you some advice and may God be with you. You must be the people's representative before God and bring their disputes to him. Teach them, his, teach them his decrees and instructions and show them the way that they are to live and how they are to behave. There you have the first pastoral job description in scripture. That Listen, if you're here, your leader and you're placed on that, this is what I want you to do. And then Moses received some incredible, incredible instructions. Look at verse 21. He says, but select capable men from all the people, men who fear God, trustworthy men who hate dishonest gain and appoint them as officials over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties and over tens. Have them serve as judges for the people at, uh, at all times, but have them bring the very most difficult cases to you. The simple cases they can decide for themselves. The color of the carpet at church, let them decide. The color of the chairs, let them decide. The color of the walls, let them... Oh, but well, that's not there, is it? Okay, kind of reverted back for a minute, amen? You ever been there? <laughs> he says, that will make your load lighter because they will share it with you. And if you do this, and God so commands you'll be able to stand the strain and all these people will go home satisfied. And so Moses did something incredible. He actually followed what his father-in-law said. And he began to set up small groups of hundreds and fifties and tens to do the work of ministry, to be shared. You go, yeah, that's the Old Testament, Edward. Okay, then let's jump over to Acts chapter six. Because in Acts chapter six in the New Testament, we see something going on. We just read it in Acts chapter two, verse 42. They're already meeting together. They're already sharing life together. But then there becomes this dispute in Acts chapter six about, hey, our widows aren't getting fed like their widows. And so they get this idea over food, 50 tons of food, Jim. They're trying to give it away. Well, they're getting too much and they're not getting enough. So they bring it back to them and they have this conversation in Acts chapter six. It says in those days when the disciples numbers was increasing, they were growing, they were reaching more people. People and more needs were, because see, the more people you reach, the more needs that you have and the more influence you have in the communities, the more needs you have to reach. And so that's what's going on here. The Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Isn't that good? <laughs> Maybe I enjoyed that too much. Um, Brothers and sisters, verse three, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them. And we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And here we see the very first deacons that were appointed to take care of a small group of widows. And you see, here's what happens when we believe the holy man myth. When we, when we put everything on one guy or a small group of three or four people is that pastors and staff will lose their identity. They lose their identity because there's no way they can measure up to the job description that I grew up with. They'll lose their identity and they will absolutely work themselves to a point where they quit. And what we find here in the Old Testament and the New Testament, God never designed it to be based on one man. It's only based on Jesus Christ. And then from there, we share the ministry. We share the ministry that some are to equip while the rest of us serve. You see, the holy man myth will deceive us into believing that the holy man must teach you everything. That, that he's going to get up here and wow you every week or she's going to wow you every week. And you'll start believing that you can only grow under one person. And you'll hear things like this. Well, I'm not growing there. Well, it's not up to me whether or not you grow. Can I just say that? I'm just going to say that. It's not up to me whether you grow. Here's what I do know. Healthy things grow. Okay? Unhealthy things don't. If you're not growing, that's not my fault. Okay? I want you to hear that. Now, I don't always knock it out of the park. Okay? I know that. I'm not a major league baseball player, all right? Every once in a while, I hit a foul ball because y'all send me an email, amen? <laughs> I know. It's your responsibility to grow. And guess what? It's my responsibility for me to grow. And when you start setting up men or a group of small people that they're the only ones that you grow from, you're in trouble. Because it'll deceive you that they think they know, that they know everything. It'll also deceive you that, that these guys have to be perfect. 
And by the way, we're not perfect. In fact, if you knew everything about me, you wouldn't attend this church. And if I knew everything about you, I wouldn't let you attend this church, amen? So don't look at me judgmental. The reality is we all have junk in our past. When we set one group of people up as a holy man, that holy myth will destroy us. Listen, I can't change you. You're responsible for changing you. It's the responsibility of God the Father in your journey and you knowing this group. That's why we spent so much time this summer on helping you develop a plan to meet with God during the week, a plan for you to pray during the week, a plan for you to cultivate your growth during the week. And by the way, the holy man can't fix all your problems. Just can't. Only God can do that. Only God can step in the middle of that. And I know we've seen some mind-blowing things here from healings to people's marriages being restored, the teenagers coming back, and they've been incredible things. It had nothing to do with us. It had everything to do with the Father. Everything. See, he's the only one that's omnipotent. We're not. And so small groups have been a part of God's plans from the beginning. Even when Moses set himself up as a holy man, God came in and said, listen, son, you're gonna die. And in the New Testament, when people weren't getting needs met, that, that, that he brought in that visual, that, that plan of small groups. And listen, some people have asked me around here, y'all have elders, but you don't have deacons. Yes, we do have deacons. And let me tell you who they are. They're small group leaders. They're small group leaders. Small group leaders are the deacon model in our church both male and female, that they're the ones serving. They're the ones doing the ministry. They're the ones going to the hospitals. They're the ones providing meals. We'll talk about that in a minute. But you see that small groups debunk the holy man myth, but also the holy place myth. Here's what the holy place myth says. The idea that God's presence is somehow greater in some places than in others. We've gotten this idea that we're no longer the church. We go to church. That's something spiritual about this old metal building. You know what makes this old metal building spiritual? The fact that you're in it. Because guess what? God doesn't live here. Come up here at two o'clock in the morning with me when the alarm's going off and you'll find out God doesn't live here, amen? I carry a pistol on that, uh, that time of the morning, amen? If the alarm's going off, I don't come up here. I send the police. There's nothing spiritual about this old building. It's a metal building, anybody can go build it. What makes it spiritual? Some people believe that this is a holy place. Take your hat off in here. I can't believe you're wearing a hat. You remember those days? Can't believe you'd wear shorts in here. Need to be quiet, take your shoes off. Wear your Sunday best, son. Where's your suit? Y'all remember those days? And by all means, don't you dare laugh. Don't you, stop it. Y'all quit it. Y'all remember that? Look at Psalms 139, we read it a while ago. This is so good. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. See here, David was talking about how good God is and he couldn't outrun God. But listen, can I just tell you this? God's not confined to a building anymore. We are the church. He's not distanced from his creation. Every inch of space throughout the universe has all of his attributes in it. In him we live and move and exist. So we can have small groups at homes. We can have small groups at church. We can have small groups at your office, in the field house, at the gym, at the red rooster, around the campfire, down on the river, amen, come on. At the shooting range, yes, can I get an amen? Matthew 18, 20 simply says this, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. There's nothing spiritual about this building, but there's something incredibly holy about you that call yourselves believers in Jesus. And let's be honest, in most churches, there aren't many opportunities for high impact, upfront, life on life ministries. And that's what makes small groups so powerful because small groups open up the opportunities for everybody to be involved in ministry. They empower people to ministry. See, at Summit Heights, we want every group to have a leader and a host. And here's what that looks like. For most of our groups, it's a couple that host it and a couple that leads it. There's four leaders there. And that means in every group, there are four leaders sitting there to teach, 
to counsel, to disciple, to pray for the group every day, to pray with them, to provide meals for them when they need them, to contact group members regularly, to visit hospitals with those who are in groups, lead worship, serve communion, and yes, even baptize them. Isn't that incredible? And all of a sudden, the outreach, as Joe said, when we reached about 12, there was my limit. And on any given day, I can do about 35, amen, as one guy. That's that's about it. So all of a sudden, small groups open up an opportunity for all of us to be in ministry, to be in leadership. And none of that could be accomplished without every one of us being in a group doing life together. In fact, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11 says this, for each one of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administrating God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. Here's why God wants us to do it. So Jesus will be lifted up. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. See, here's what makes groups so powerful. We're not limited to Sunday only. You can actually do a small group anytime during the week. You can do it at four o'clock in the morning for you people that get up that early, amen? It may be you and alone, but you can do that. You can work around your family schedules. You're not tied down to a location. And all of a sudden the church becomes spread out across the community. You see, ministry takes place in groups that undercuts that myth that crippled the church, but they also dramatically increase your growth. See, I believe you can grow on your own. I I really do. Some of you are smart and some of you can do that, but I believe that we were designed to be in relationship. We were designed to exponentially grow together. See, our mission is to connect people to God and others. Everything is about relationships. But we really want you to grow. And here's how we define a win in ministry. Because listen, I'm telling you, I, I really am foolish enough to believe we can reach everybody in Hawkins. We can reach everybody in Big Sandy, everybody in Mineola, everybody. I'm telling you, I'm foolish enough to believe that. But in order for that to happen, then then number one, in our small groups, we want you to connect with God because we want you to grow in intimacy with God. We want you to grow in intimacy with him. Ephesians 4, 15 basically says, instead, speaking the truth of love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ Jesus. In other words, here's what Paul's saying. I want you to grow up. So when you get in a small group, guess what? I'm not worried about you anymore. I'm going after the next guy. I'm not worried about who we're keeping. I'm worried about who we're getting, amen? Because if you get into a small group, I don't have to worry about you anymore. You're being taken care of. And then I get to move on to the next one. Let's go. You ready? Amen. See, I want you to grow in your relationship with God, to be equipped. But I also want you to grow in your community with insiders, that there are other people around you, that you're growing together. James five sixteen says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be what? Huh? What? Healed. Come on, do you believe that? Yes. So that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful. And effective. Not the prayer of the holy man, the prayer of a righteous man. That's you. If you're in Jesus, you have been made righteous through him. So that means now your prayer is just as effective as what you thought your senior pastor was growing up. Because that prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. People come to me all the time, well, pastor, when you pray, you got a, you got a quicker line to heaven. I go, no, I don't. In fact, I'm probably further away than you right now. You probably need to be praying for me, Amen. We want you to grow with insiders, but then thirdly, we want you to reach the lost. We want you to connect with people that are outside. First Corinthians 9, 22. I love this. Paul said to the weak, I become weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people, that by all means, I might save some. By all means. Listen, I'm willing to be a hypocrite if it means I'm going to win somebody. Amen. Every once in a while, I was talking to a couple out in the uh, foyer a while ago, and there's, there's times I never introduced myself as a pastor. You want to know why? I don't want them to know. Because their language changes, their body changes, and then they're like, hey, I got to go. Sometimes I just want to be weak so I can win the weak. I want to be strong so I can win the strong. You mean you're going to act? Yeah. I am. Well, that's hypocritical. Really? That's what Paul's saying. 
He says, look, man, if I need to go down the law road, I'll go down the law road. And I can also go down that grace road. But listen, here's why I'm doing it. I'm doing it so that I might by all means save some. See, listen, guys, that's why we're here. We believe that Summit Heights is more than a chair. It's more than a place to sit in rows. It's not linear. This is linear. You walk out that door, it gets real circular real quick. Amen? That's why small groups are so powerful. Because small groups are going to make disciplines a, a priority. But lastly, I think the reason small groups are so powerful is because it sends a powerful message to our kids. And you've heard me speak this summer about our generation that we're raising. But I think small groups send a powerful message. In Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 7, it says, These commandments I give to you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. See, there's two significant phases in a child's life that are very powerful. And that's the openness and responsiveness of characteristics of little children. You ever notice little children, they trust. They'll go after anything. They're just like sponges. They're soaking up everything. And then there's those forward-thinking attitudes of teenagers. Amen? (laughs) We go from soaking up everything to rejecting everything because they're testing it. Two incredibly formative years. You see, as research states that if a child does not accept Jesus Christ by the age of 14, the chances of them becoming a believer after the age of 14 greatly diminishes. It greatly diminishes. The evangelistic openness is just one example of the responsiveness of the message we should be sending to our children. And the two years that, that they're just before puberty, God bless them. If you have one in puberty right now, wow. Those two years when they're physical and emotional and cognitive and relational, social, and and of course they're spiritual, they're brand new thinking thanks to puberty. When kids are pushing back and it almost seems like they're, they're rejecting what they've learned, which is a normal process of coming along. It's faith evaluation is normal for kids. But here's where I think small groups are so powerful in the message they send the kids because more is caught than is ever taught. Let me say that again. Parents, if you're sitting in this room this morning and this first time you've been at church or maybe you've been at church all your life, can I just say this? Your words really don't matter because your kids will pick up more on what you do than what you say. Because if your words don't match your actions, then your children can't hear what you're saying because your actions will drown out their words. I've done it. And every one of us are to pause because it's not necessarily what we say, it's what we do. Our kids are watching us. They're watching how you do your marriage. They're watching how you do relationships. And dads, can I be honest with you in the room? Men, can I be honest with you in the room? The reason we love Crucible is because it puts men in relationships that are authentic and real and able to actually do life together. And men today have sent a message to the kids that we are loners, we are cavemen, and we do it all alone. And small groups send a powerful message. Y'all remember the old statement, monkey see, monkey do? Y'all remember that? I think that's really what happens. And it's appropriate for us. Listen, if you aren't working with your children when they're young, you'll be spending a whole lot of time with them maybe in court when they're old. Honest. And that's why it's important that what we do now, they're catching what we're doing to help them understand because they're watching us. And you may not like what they understand versus the lip service. And you can say all day that your relationship with Jesus is important. And yet here's what happens. The only place you ever pray, if you pray, is at church on Sunday. The only place you ever open your Bible, if you carry a Bible, is on Sunday. You can say all day that Jesus is important, yet your job, you spend 70 to 80 hours a week at your job. Sports is more important because you spend more time in sports a year than you do ever seeking the face of God. That recreation and playing is more important than your relationship with Jesus. 
That money is more important. Getting a secular education is more important. Politics, hello, is more important. So we say that God is number one in our life, but what our kids are watching is what we do every day. And I think small group sends a powerful message that if any of those things or anything you would fill in the blank supersedes your relationship with Jesus Christ, your kids are watching. Your kids are watching what you do. And you're teaching your kids that there are more important things in this life other than making the name of Jesus known. And we believe that small groups is is a perfect place for your kids to watch. Our kids ask us every week, are we having small group this week? And they'll go, dang. Do we have to? And here's what we say to them. Yeah, we we do. Because we need that. We need that. And yeah, there's some Sunday afternoons, our small group, I'm worn out. I don't really want to go. But when we get there, the fellowship and the growth and the prayer and the relationships, see, it changes you. And our kids are modeling that. Our kids are seeing that because more is caught than is taught. So listen to me, I love you. And I want something for you. I really do. Church, we're as big as we'll ever get if we believe the holy man myth. We're as big as we'll ever get. This is all we can reach if we believe this is the only holy place of God. So I want something for you. But I also want something for this community. I want something for those of you that are watching. See, I want you to be in a group where you're growing in your relationship with God. To where you got some accountability. And I believe that happens best in circles. It doesn't happen in rows. It happens in circles where you're doing life together. You're learning, you're growing weekly, bi-weekly. I don't care. Some of you have communion together every week with the same group of people. There's your small group. Y'all go eat together. Y'all go hang out together. Spend time together growing and sharpening. I want that for you. I want you to develop a close-knit group of believers that are growing together and helping you. Because listen, life is gonna happen. It does. Your marriage may be beautiful today. And I'm telling you, there's gonna be a season where you struggle when one of you gets sick or one of you make a mistake and one of you sins. You're gonna need a group of people around you to walk with you. And I want you to share the good news of Jesus because I'm just foolish enough to believe we can reach all of Hawkins. I'm just foolish enough to believe that we can reach all of Big Sandy and Harmony and Mineola and Quitman and Winsboro because that's what he's called us to do. And people are watching us. That's why we're fanatical about groups. So I would just say, if you don't have one, Create one, start one, get in one. In fact, over the next few weeks, you're gonna hear more and more about groups. Jake's gonna be preaching a whole message on groups and giving you an opportunity to get in them because life is gonna happen at some point and you need a group of people who will walk with you. And I love Summit, I love you, but I'm just telling you, I want what I've experienced in small groups to happen for you. I want you to be able to have a group of people around you when life happens. Because there's gonna be a lid on your spiritual growth if you pursue it on your own. God created us for relationship. He designed us for relational needs. And no matter what your expectations of church has been growing up, I wanna tell you that it could look different if you'll get in groups and you begin to meet together. I don't, you don't have to do it every week. I know some people can't do that. Do it every other week. Do it on the pickleball courts. I don't care. Get together. Start growing. Don't settle for mediocrity in your spiritual growth. I can promise you it ain't gonna always be smooth sailing. I promise you. Life doesn't happen linear. But man, when you're in a group and life is happening, it's great to have a group of people around you. Because I'm gonna be honest with you, when you get in a group, I'm not gonna worry about you. I'm fixing to go on to somebody else and bring them in, amen? And I'm gonna keep going and I'm gonna keep pushing and I'm gonna keep equipping. And that's why we believe in groups. So if you're not in one, get ready, create one. Let us know, let us come beside you. You see, we exist for one thing, to connect people to God and others. And everything is about the bottom line of what? 
relationships. Say it with me. What's the bottom line? What's the bottom line? Relationship. relationship with God and relationship with others. Amen? Let me pray for you. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for just letting us talk honestly and openly to learn from your word that God, even from the beginning, we had this idea that it was based on us, one guy, one small group, but God, it's settled once and for all on the cross. It's about Jesus. And God, you've called some to be pastors, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be teachers. God, you've, you've given roles to equip. And God, you've even given us a picture of what it means to be in, in small groups, doing life together. So God, I pray that if there's someone here this morning, number one, that doesn't know Jesus, God, you'd give them the courage this morning that your Holy Spirit would pursue them. And God, they would surrender their life to you. And God, for that one that's sitting out here and very honestly, their perception of church and the Bible and, and, and just small groups, God, the enemy's just beating them up from their past. God, would you give them the courage to take that step, to be known? to grow in their relationship with you, to grow in their relationship with others. And God, that all of us would develop those relationships with those people that are far, far, far from you, that we can show them that Jesus is not what the news says, what the internet says, it's what he says about himself, to love you and to love others. So God, give us the courage to go out of this place today and all the messiness, I love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. Hey, I love you, don't miss next week. I promise you, it's gonna be good. Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.